So this is an introduction to the history of philosophy, thought, and ideas. Let's jump right in. First off, one of the definitions that you'll need to know is the word etymology. Etymology, as you see on your screen, is the study of word origins and histories, which is usually done by dissecting a word into its component parts and defining them. So what we're going to begin to do today is give an etymology of philosophy. The word philosophy has two parts, philo, meaning love, and sophos, coming from the Greek sophia, which comes into English as sophie, meaning wisdom. The root philo, meaning love, can be seen in various other words like philanthropy, which would mean the love of humanity, where anthropos is a word that refers to humans or humanity, or in words like pedophile, um, or other words with the file or file uh, ending to it. Uh, pedophile, certainly not love as we usually think of it. Um, but that is what the word means. There are other examples that you might be familiar with. For example, you may know the motto for the city of Philadelphia, which is the city of brotherly love, where philo, again, means love. So hopefully that will help you remember what philo means. The second word, sophos, or Sophia or Sophie, meaning wisdom, is the same word that you see in the word sophomore. Uh, literally a wise fool, where the more of sophomore is uh, the word, same as our English word meaning moron. We also see it in words like sophistry, which you may be less familiar with. Sophistry as I've indicated on this PowerPoint slide, it refers to the art of debate, and it also refers to a group of ancient Greek rhetoricians, or teachers of argumentative strategies and techniques. And the famous philosopher Socrates uh, critiques the sophists, or literally the wise ones, for being more interested in winning arguments rather than inquiring about the truth. So we can define philosophy as the love of wisdom, but it's also interested in things like truth and a, a number of other areas that we'll discuss in just a moment. So we're going to use the language of branches to refer to the traditional areas of philosophy, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics or moral philosophy, social and political philosophy, or sometimes socio-political philosophy, and finally aesthetics. Let's go through each of them in turn. To use a piece of vocabulary that we just learned, the etymology of metaphysics is that meta means beyond or after, and physics has to do with what is natural or what is physical. So the literal definition of metaphysics would be what is beyond the physical realm. but there is something more specific when we use this term in philosophical discourse. For our purposes, let's define metaphysics as the branch of philosophy that deals with questions about the ultimate nature of reality. Big questions such as, is there or is there not a god? That's primarily 
what metaphysics deals with. And that's actually where a lot of philosophy starts, with questioning the biggest ideas. We'll deal more with those issues later. For now, let's distinguish three ways in which the root word metaphysic or metaphysics can be used. First, the word can be used singularly as in metaphysic. Metaphysic would refer usually to a person or a group's beliefs about the ultimate nature of reality. So we could say, for example, Christianity is a metaphysic in the sense that Christianity is a system of beliefs about the ultimate nature of reality. Or we could say Islam is a metaphysic. It is a system of beliefs about the ultimate nature of reality. Or we could say that Hinduism is a metaphysic. It's a system of beliefs about the ultimate nature of reality. One that includes many, many, many different gods or deities. When an S is added to the end of metaphysics, or to metaphysic and becomes metaphysics, that word can be either singular or plural. In its singular form, metaphysics refers to the branch of philosophy that deals with questions about the ultimate nature of reality. However, it could although it's less often, be used to refer to multiple individual systems of beliefs. For example, in the sentence I've provided, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are varieties of metaphysics people believe in. Lastly, there's the adjective or even adverbial form, metaphysical or metaphysically. This is where things might get confusing. Metaphysical can refer to these big questions about what is reality? Does it include a god or gods? Does it include a heaven or a hell? Does it include angels or an afterlife? All of those we could call metaphysical questions. But, often people use the word metaphysical as synonymous or interchangeable with supernatural. We should distinguish between these two uses of the word metaphysical. While metaphysical in terms of etymology can mean beyond the physical. So similar to supernatural. It doesn't have to. For example, I can say an angel is a supernatural being or a metaphysical being. I can say that the devil is a supernatural being or a metaphysical being. I can say that God is a supernatural being or a metaphysical being. I can say that heaven or hell is a supernatural place or a metaphysical place. However, there is at least one metaphysical system, that is, system of beliefs about the ultimate nature of reality that does not include anything metaphysical in it. That would be atheism. Atheism is a metaphysical system. 
However, it is a metaphysical system in the sense that it is a set of beliefs about the ultimate nature of reality. Specifically, that there are no gods, there is no afterlife, there is no heaven, there is no hell. So, atheism, as a metaphysical system, contains nothing supernatural within it. So, while most metaphysical systems have supernatural things, there's at least one set of beliefs about the ultimate nature of reality, or metaphysic, that does not contain anything supernatural. And that would be atheism. Let's go on. These get easier from here. The second of the five traditional branches of philosophy is epistemology. You can wor use words like epistemological, epistemologically, sometimes epistemic. Epistemology is the branch of philosophy that deals with questions of how we know what we know. So when you hear the word epistemology or epistemological used, you should translate in your head, this is asking, how do we know what we know? Let's give an important example of different epistemologies, systems of knowing. First, consider the difference between the epistemology of science as opposed to the epistemology of religion. What do you think the difference between these two epistemologies or epistemological systems are? what you'll likely find is that science has something called the scientific method. That's its system for gaining knowledge. That is its epistemology. On the other hand, religions usually have different epistemologies. Very often, the epistemology of a religion is based on divine revelation or perhaps also mysticism. Divine revelation would be God speaking to a person. For example, God revealing the Ten Commandments and the books of the law to Moses, God speaking to Abraham or Solomon, or in Islam, the Archangel Gabriel revealing the divine wisdom of the Holy Quran to Muhammad. All of these are considered divine revelation. However, they are necessarily more subjective. Subjective simply means dependent upon the person, as opposed to objective, meaning not dependent upon the person. For example, you could have your own personal divine revelation. You could say, God told me I should become a doctor. But someone standing next to you 
could neither confirm nor deny this. It's impossible to tell if your claim is accurate. Therefore, we must necessarily call this epistemology, the, the epistemology of divine revelation, more subjective. That's not to say untrue, but it is harder, if not even impossible, to confirm or deny the accuracy of that knowledge. Let's go on. The next couple are quite easy. The third traditional branch of philosophy is ethics, or moral philosophy. It deals with questions of right and wrong, good and bad, as well as evil, and moral or immoral. Ethics is the branch of philosophy that deals with questions of morality. Sometimes people think that ethics is the only thing that philosophy does. But really, it's just one of five traditional areas of interest for philosophy. But since it's relatively easy to wrap your head around, we won't spend much time right this moment discussing it. However, we will spend most of the semester dealing with questions of ethics and how our ethical choices and choices of ethical systems affect our personal lives as well as political lives. That brings us to the fourth traditional branch of philosophy, which is political philosophy, sometimes social philosophy or socio-political philosophy. It deals with questions like what is the best form of government? What is the nature of justice? So we could define political philosophy as the branch of philosophy that deals with questions of justice and government. For example, one of the most well-known philosophical texts, Plato's Republic, is an extended discussion of a simple question. What is just? There are other questions that we can ask in the context of political philosophy such as, is democracy the best form of government? While we might be tempted to think, yes, there are strong arguments to the contrary. For example, while Plato writes that democracy is the sweetest, he argues instead for a system of rule by the best, the intellectual elites, which is a type of elitism, which may or may not work out in practice. There are interesting historical and cultural examples that might illuminate that. And as a society, we Americans are very often wary or distrustful of the intellectual elite. Consider if you think people would enjoy in our society, being ruled over by people who supposedly know better than them. I'll leave you to ponder those questions on your own for now. Lastly, aesthetics.
Aesthetics is the branch of philosophy that deals with questions of art and beauty. I'll just give a few brief examples at the moment of some questions that can be asked dealing with aesthetics. One example comes from a Renaissance European philosopher named Immanuel Kant. Kant, in a text titled The Critique of Judgment, writes that although people think that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, instead he argues that beauty is not subjective but objective. That it's the same for all of us and not dependent upon the person. This seems like a wild and um, indefensible claim. To help make sense of it, we could imagine 100 people going to see Michelangelo's statue of David. Kant's theory would suggest that if 99 people thought that it was a beautiful artwork and then a 100th person came up and said, I don't think it's beautiful, the 99 could turn to that 100th and say, no, you're wrong. You lack artistic taste. That's an interesting claim. That's probably wrong. And it's okay for us to point out that philosophers may be wrong. Probably most of the history of philosophy is significantly wrong. Sometimes people say that being wrong in a useful way is what's especially important. But of course that might be wrong also. So where are we? I'll leave you to think through that one. One final example of aesthetics. There's a famous artist from the 20th century named Marcel Duchamp. Duchamp is famous for taking a men's urinal, sticking it on the wall of an art gallery, and calling it art. Aesthetics is the branch of philosophy that would attempt to answer, is it or is it not? At some point later, someone tried to one-up Duchamp and take the urinal, flip it upside down, and put a statue of the Madonna, Mary, mother of Jesus, in the upturned urinal. Now the question again is, is that art? What you might notice is that your answer to the question perhaps depends upon your cultural context. 
to an especially devout religious person, they would likely say, that's profane. That's obscene. It's not art or it's not good art. However, to a person of a different religion or a person that's not religious at all, they might see that as an ironic or absurd juxtaposition, putting the sacred and the profane side by side each other like that. There are other aesthetic questions we'll ask and study this semester. For example, Plato's aesthetic, which is quite unique and unexpected, as well as the political and radical poetry of American poet Allen Ginsberg. That's all for now. The next video will focus on issues of logic.